Over a century ago, around $28,000 in gold and silver coins went missing following the relatively obscure Wham Paymaster robbery near Pima, Arizona. Although eight individuals were apprehended and brought to trial in connection with the crime, they ultimately walked away as free men. The narrative of the robbery and the enduring mystery that surrounds it remains unresolved to this day. In the early hours of May 11, 1889, U.S. Army Paymaster Major Joseph Washington Wham was getting ready for a journey from Fort Grant to Fort Thomas to disperse salaries to the soldiers. Having paid the troops at Fort Grant the day before, the men at Fort Thomas, Camp San Carlos, and Fort Apache were still awaiting their pay. Wham, accompanied by his clerk William Gibbon and Private Caldwell, his servant and mule tender, boarded a canopied ambulance driven by Buffalo Soldier Private Hamilton Lewis for the 46-mile trip to Fort Thomas. The payroll, totaling over $28,000 in gold and silver coins, was securely locked in an oak strongbox within the ambulance. Transporting such a valuable payload, Wham was accompanied by a substantial escort including nine Buffalo soldiers from the 24th Infantry on horseback and a wagon driven by a civilian employee of the Quartermaster Department which carried two privates from the 10th Cavalry, also an African-American regiment. Everyone except Wham, his clerk, and the two drivers was armed. Just before departure, they were unexpectedly joined by Frankie Campbell, a black female gambler who wanted to travel with them to be in Fort Thomas when the soldiers received their pay. Approximately 15 miles west of Pima in the Gila River Valley, around midday, the caravan came to a halt due to a large boulder blocking the road. As the wagons struggled to maneuver around it, the soldiers temporarily set aside their weapons to remove the obstacle. However, before making much headway, a shout echoed from a ledge about 60 feet above on the adjacent hill. Look out, you black sons of bitches! Bullets began to rain down on the soldiers. Three of the 12 mules pulling the wagons were killed, causing the remaining animals to panic, rear up, and drag both vehicles off the road. In the midst of the chaos, the soldiers hastily reached for their guns and sought cover. With bullets persistently raining down on them from three heavily fortified sides, Sergeant Benjamin Brown sustained a gunshot wound but courageously kept returning fire with his revolver. Simultaneously, Private James Young braved the intense gunfire, covering more than 100 yards to carry Brown to safety. Taking charge, Corporal Isaiah Mays ordered the group to retreat to a creek bed approximately 300 yards away, despite objections from Major Wham. The skirmish endured for about half an hour as the soldiers bravely defended the valuable payload. Unfortunately, eight out of Wham's 11-man escort suffered severe wounds, tilting the battle significantly in favor of the assailants. Throughout all this, Frankie Campbell, the gambler who had been riding ahead of the caravan, was thrown from her horse and sought cover. While the soldiers remained concealed and injured, a group of five bandits approached the ambulance wagon used an axe to break open the strong box and made off with the U.S. Treasury sacks filled with coins. As the outlaws made their escape, the soldiers counted a total of 12 of them. Around 3 p.m., those who could muster the strength wearily left the creek bed and returned to the wagons. The soldiers managed to cobble together harnesses, round up some of the surviving mules, and eventually made their way to Fort Thomas, reaching the destination around 5.30. Meanwhile, Frankie Campbell had been tasked with caring for the severely wounded, including Sergeant Benjamin Brown, who would be brought in later. Remarkably, all of the soldiers managed to survive their injuries. During the gun battle, several of the bandits, who had not bothered to cover their faces, had been recognized. Within no time, U.S. Deputy Marshal William Kidder Meade, along with the Graham County Sheriff, had arrested 11 men, most of whom were citizens of Pima, Arizona. Seven individuals were scheduled to face trial, among them Gilbert Webb, who served as the mayor of Pima during the incident and was believed to be the leader of the bandit gang. His son, Wilfred, was also included in the group. Both were suspected of various thefts in the area. The list of those to be tried also featured the Webb brothers' co-workers, Lyman and Warren Follett, David Rogers, Thomas Lamb, and Mark Cunningham, all employed as cowboys by Gilbert Webb. Notably, although the men faced charges related to the robbery, no one was ever charged for the shooting. 
The trial in the federal court in Tucson took place in November, lasting 33 days and causing a sensation in the Southwest. Right from the start, the proceedings were marked by significant political maneuvering and internal conflicts, including the replacement of the original judge. A total of 165 witnesses testified during the trial, with five Buffalo soldiers identifying three of the accused. One witness claimed to have seen individuals hiding the stolen items in a haystack and burning U.S. Treasury sacks. Additional testimonies indicated that some of the accused were seen in the area the day before, likely preparing their hideouts from where the bullets had come. Notably, Frankie Campbell, who had asserted recognition of several bandits, including the leader Gilbert Webb, was never called to testify. Represented by the renowned lawyer Marcus Aurelius Smith, all the men were acquitted. Following the trial, widespread assertions suggested that political influence from the acting governor played a role in the thieves' release. The entire case became a nexus of religion, racism, and politics given that Pima, Arizona was established as a Mormon colony, with Gilbert Webb serving as the mayor and one of the most influential figures in the region. Webb came from a long line of pioneer Mormons and was known for his generosity, offering employment to struggling neighbors, extending credit, and providing provisions. Uh -huh. While most of the other accused individuals were not Mormons, they all resided in the Mormon colony and had various connections to the church through friends and relatives. To many area locals, the robbery and trial were an embarrassing disgrace to the town and its people. And to talk about it might offend friends or neighbors or disgrace the colony. Therefore, the robbery was not publicized to the extent of other large robberies of the time. However, quietly, Locals were said to have referred to the robbers as Latter-day Robin Hoods. It's believed that Gilbert Webb used the majority of the money to settle debts, forgive debts owed by other members of the colony, and cover legal expenses for himself and the other accused men. The year following the trial, he was elected as a delegate to the Territorial Democratic Convention. However, at a later time, he faced indictment for defrauding the Pima School District of $160. He subsequently left the area and eventually ended up in Mexico. Meanwhile, Major Joseph Washington Wham, as the commanding officer, was initially held responsible for the money's loss, but was later cleared of any wrongdoing. Two of the Buffalo soldiers received the Medal of Honor for their roles in the gun battle with the bandits. Despite being shot in the abdomen, Sergeant Benjamin Brown continued fighting until he sustained further wounds in both arms. Corporal Isaiah Mays also earned the Medal of Honor. Towards the end of the gun battle, despite being shot in the legs, he walked and crawled two miles to Cottonwood Ranch and gave the alarm. Other Buffalo soldiers recognized for their bravery in the incident were awarded the Certificate of Merit. Among them were Hamilton Lewis, Squire Williams, George Arrington, James Wheeler, Benjamin Burge, Thomas Hams, James Young, and Julius Harrison, serving in the 10th Cavalry and 24th Infantry. U.S. Deputy Marshal Meade, responsible for apprehending the bandits, remarked about the soldiers, I am satisfied a braver or better defense could not have been made under like circumstances. The questions surrounding the guilt or innocence of the bandits, as well as the fate of the stolen loot, remain unanswered to this day. Over the years, the robbery has sparked various treasure tales, suggesting that some of the coins may still be hidden in the area. However, with all the suspects released, such claims seemed doubtful.